Hello, thank you very much for joining the Andor Microscopy School. I will be talking to you today about transmitted light microscopy. So what is transmitted light microscopy? Transmitted light microscopy means that the light passes, is transmitted from the source to the lens and by doing so it also passes through the sample. This method is very useful to distinguish morphological characteristics and optics of the observed material. It also provides an extra channel that offers the context to fluorescent stainings. And most importantly, due to the very low energy used in transmitted light microscopy techniques, they are extremely useful for live imaging experiments. So it's a good technique to bear in mind and when choose appropriately the transmitted light microscopy technique to use can be extremely useful for your research applications. In today's webinar, I will talk about, I've divided it into parts, and the first part will be on general concepts in microscopy, and I will talk about optical equipment, anatomy of the microscope, what is inside an objective, optical aberrations and resolution in microscopy. And then I will talk about transmitted light microscopy techniques. I will explain the bright field, dark field, phase contrast and the IC techniques. So starting from the first part of our webinar, general concepts in microscopy. Before starting to introduce most of the general concepts in microscopy that I would like to talk to you today, I would please uh, stop first to talk to you that, about the precautions you need to take with the optical equipment. The optical equipment is prone to damage and is sensitive. And once damaged, you can destroy the quality of your images forever. So please be aware, never stain, twist or drop the objectives. Do not force the controls of the objective of the condenser and always watch the lens surfaces as they approach the specimen in order not to damage irreversible an objective. And do not touch the optical surfaces with your own hands. So please be aware when you're doing a microscopy experiment, there's a, a, a sentence that's garbage in equals garbage out you will not be able to have a nice image if you don't have a very well prepared sample. And to have a very well prepared sample, everything counts from when you fix your sample, when you stain your sample and where you mount your sample. So the cover slips of your slides and uh, uh, the, the, the thickness of your slide and cover slips will count. So choose glass slides with one millimeter thick and the objectives are designed in a way that they are optimized for 0 0.17 millimeter thickness of glass. So the ideal grade for most of the objectives is 1.5. And you can always check if, which kind of objective you're using if by any chance is different. For super resolution, be aware to choose the 1.5 H objectives, high quality objectives, which will have a thickness even more stringent for 0 0.17 to 0 0.18 millimeter thick. So please remember, everything counts when you're preparing your sample. The thickness of your cover slips and slides will count and will influence the final good quality of your image. So, going through the anatomy of a microscope, what are the names of all these parts on the microscope? So, these are the eyepieces. This is the tourette or noise piece. And here are the objectives. This is the microscope stage and the sample holder. The large button, uh, it's the coarse focus and the small one is the fine focus that will allow you to coarse focus 
move the stage quickly and the fine focus move the stage more slowly when you're getting close to the uh, to focusing your sample then you have the condenser which is an uh, a lens that for transmitted light is underneath of the stage and will focus the light in a way to increase the resolving power but i will talk a bit more on the condenser so the diaphragm of the condenser and the condenser itself then you have this knob over here which allow you to focus the condenser and this one and this one are the condenser centering screws the field diaphragm and the transmitted light micros uh, the transmitted light control and also you can align the lamp generally the alignment controls on the lamp are on the back of the microscope so i will talk a bit more on this part here of the microscope which is the condenser so if you look on the sideways you have the diaphragm of the condenser and the condenser so the diaphragm is like an iris that will open and close allowing more light to go through the condenser to the sample or less light so what is there what is the condenser there for so in order to increase the aperture of the objective and the resolving power of, of the microscope uh, the condenser is added on the bottom of the stage and what the condenser does is that it will increase the angle of the light rays captured that goes to the sample and therefore it will increase the angle of the lights that will be captured by the objective increasing therefore the resolving power so what is the relationship between the condenser and the numerical aperture of the condenser so the condenser the light that goes through the condenser and the numerical aperture if you increase the numerical aperture of the condenser what would you expect to observe on the cone of light that goes through the condenser so when we increase the numerical aperture of the condenser more light passes through the condenser to go to the sample and the numerical aperture of an objective is defined by the equation the numerical aperture is n which is the refractive index sin of alpha which is one half of the wider angle that is captured by the objective therefore the numerical aperture is directly related with the resolution higher numerical aperture should correspond to higher resolving power so uh, i have this image of something uh, uh, it was beads that were used to image and then it was tested different numerical apertures to image exactly the same sample what do you think it will happen when you increase the numerical aperture of this objective to visualize this sample as you increase the numerical aperture of the objective you increase the uh, uh, you wider the angle of light that is captured by the same objective and therefore you increase the resolving power so we pass from a blob that we don't know what's there to find out that we have four beads in this blob higher values of numerical aperture will allow higher resolution smaller structures will therefore be visible with higher quality and resolution is in fact the ability to to distinguish two close dots as separated and continuing to talk about resolution why do you think is oil used in the objectives 
so the oil is used to extend the resolving power of the microscope. But why? Why does it happen? It happens because the glass has a refractive index of 1.51 and the oil that is used also has the same refractive index as the glass and therefore there will not be any diffraction of the light ray, uh, rays and the wider angle of light will be captured resulting in an increase of the resolving power. So I will explain what I just mentioned with an image. You have the light source here, uh, the slide and the sample, the cover slip. This is an air cover slip and here is an objective. And when the light source is here, this is the wider angle that the air objective will be able to capture and the others will be refracted or diffracted and will not be able to be captured by the objective. On the other hand, if we use oil, there, the, the diffraction is uh, minor and there's a wider angle of light that will be captured by the objective and therefore the cone of light that is captured by the objective is greater and this will increase the resolving power of the objective and this is the reason why oil is used in microscopy. So now going through the relationship between resolution, numerical aperture and focal distance. As I mentioned before, the numerical aperture is related with the refractive index and the sign of alpha, which is the angle, a half of the angle of the wider angle that can be captured by the objective. And if you increase the numerical aperture, uh, you decrease the focal distance to be able to capture a wider angle of light. Therefore, you need to be aware that some samples will fit with a, uh, to be analyzed with a lower numerical aperture, but won't fit when the numerical aperture is extremely high and the working distance is quite small. Other practical, very simple advices, but sometimes people forget to increase the resolution and the resolving power of your microscope. Please be aware that you should clean the objective when you're imaging. The objective should be spotless clean and your sample preparations should also be clean. Please be aware, as I mentioned before, to have the cover slips and slides with the correct thickness and to use correct the correct oil with the correct refractive index and to use it correctly. So talking a bit more about objectives, the objectives are essential components on the microscope and the objective is much more than this front lens. It has a lot of single parts inside. And when you look to objective here, you would have the objective type. Here you have the code and reference where you can go with this number and check on the uh, manufacturer website exactly what is that objective for. This is the immersion media for this objective. So this objective would allow three different immersion medias with the correction color aligned to the respective immersion media. So by slicing an objective in the middle and looking at their skeleton, we can see that they are actually quite different inside and much more than just a single front lens. They also have the fluorite and apochromat meniscus lens then they have doublets of lens and the amount of doublet lens will depend on the corrections of the objectives as well as the triplet lens. And how will this, all of this influences in the final result of what an objective can deliver?
So the question is why so many lands and what happens to the rays of light when they are passing through the glass? Will it affect the microscope image? How? One of the aberrations that is corrected in the objectives is the field curvature. What is field curvature? If the objectives are not corrected for field curvature, it is not possible to focus the entire field at the same time, meaning that either we focus the center of the, the, the sample or the edges because there are different focal points of rays of light because this objective is not corrected for field curvature. This is an off-axis effect of the lens when is not corrected. Other uh, aberrations corrected in the objectives are is spherical aberration. The spherical aberration happens in monochromatic light and it is the uneven focus of mo monochromatic light due to the curvature of lens. And is, you can see that these rays of light, they are not focused all exactly at the same place. And this will cause the image to appear as a bit hazy or slightly out of focus. Sometimes this can be also corrected by adjusting the cover slip thickness or adjusting the refractive index of your sample. Other correction in the objectives is the correction for chromatic aberration. What happens is that the different wavelengths of light, if the objective is not corrected, will focus in different planes. And therefore, on a non-corrected lens, on the z-axis, a dot will appear that should colocalize, a multicolor bead that should colocalize all the colors in the same plane will appear as if they are in different z planes. On the other hand, if the objective is co uh, corrected, all the rays of light in the different wavelengths will focus on the same point, and therefore, the multicolor bead, all the colors will appear in the same Z plane. So if your objective is corrected, please check if you're using the correct oil to correct for refractive index mismatch, which also could cause some chromatic aberration. So when joining all the knowledge together, what happens in different objectives and what is corrected in terms of color. For an achromat objective, the field curvature is not corrected and it's corrected for spherical aberration for one color and chromatic aberration for two colors. A plan apo objective, the field curvature is corrected, spherical aberration one color and chromatic aberration two colors. A fluoride, the field curvature is not corrected, spherical aberration two to three colors and chromatic aberration two to three colors. A plan fluorite and the plan aprochromite, the field curvature is corrected. The spherical aberration are corrected to three to four colors in both of them, but the difference is the chromatic aberrations. In a plan apo, you have four to five color correction on chromatic aberration, whereas in a plan fluorite, you have two to four colors uh, correction. The price of the objectives will increase with the amount of lens inside and the amount of corrections. So you need to consider which objective you really need uh, uh, to, to your particular experiment or your applications. So choosing wisely, what do I mean by that? So uh, um, a few years ago, I remember when I was working in a facility uh, one of the PIs came to me and told me, uh, Claudia, I want a 40x objectives. At the time, I went back to him and say, and told him, what do you need to do? Because if you go to the website, you see that there are 42 40x objectives in 2012. 
Now I actually did the same search in the same website and they are 99 40x objectives and the problem remains how to choose. Even more surprisingly, if you go for 63C, 63x objectives, you have more than 260 objectives that you can choose from. So how do you choose with such a large variety of objectives? They are obviously different for different applications. It's, it's extremely complex to select an objective. So please take in consideration the following parameters when you're going to choose an objective. Check, check the magnification. That was our first part. That's done. What numerical aperture do you need? What working distance? Is your sample very long, very large? Do you need to work very far away from your sample or do you want to work very close to your sample? What corrections do you need for flat field, for color corrections? What transmission, wavelength transmissions do you need? And uh, the um, transmitted light techniques that you need. Do you need bright field? Do you need dark field? Phase contrast, DIC. And for fluorescence, what do you need? What transmissions do you need? Is it a water immersion objective? Oil immersion? Glycerol uh, uh, immersion? What uh, thickness of cover slips are you going to use? It is corrected. Can it be corrected? So you need to consider all of these parameters when you're choosing an objective. And now I'm going to talk about transmitted light techniques itself. So as I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, transmitted light techniques stands for a group of techniques in which the light passes through the source, through the sample, and is captured by the objective. And it's useful. It provides an extra channel for fluorescence microscopy. But it's also it's a standalone technique that can be used for live imaging or for analyzing morphology of samples when properly selected. Uh, in transmitted light, uh, light microscopy, this is our ILA cells stained, uh, non-stained. It's a bright field image, but it's actually the, the cells most of the time are very transparent and they don't have enough structures to deliver the necessary detail that our eyes can visualize. So in order to image some specimens or samples such as bacteria, live cells or th thin tissue slices, researchers sometimes use other transmitted light techniques or stain their samples. And today I'm going to talk to you about bright field, dark field, phase contrast and DIC which is differential interference contrast. So one of the things that you need to do, you should do when you're going to acquire any image in transmitted light microscopy before starting to acquire an image, check that your microscope has the proper cooler illumination aligned. This method gives a very even illumination of your sample and therefore your resulting image would be much better. And also one of the things that cooler illumination does is that you will not see the filament of the light bulb in the image. So comparing the illumination planes when you have cooler aligned, if you have the light source here, you have the focus of light here, it goes, it's focused in the sample, it is focused again in the field stop and it will focus in your eyes, in the retina or when captured. On the other hand, the lamp filament, it's focused here. It is focused on the front focal plane of the condenser, on the back focal plane of the objective and before you capture the image. And therefore, the focus plane of the lamp filament is different from the focal plane of your sample. So you can take a nice image of your sample without the interference of the image of your filament. So how to align 
cooler illumination in a microscope. The first thing you do is using the focus nub, you bring the sample into focus and then you close down the field diaphragm and you close the NA of the condenser. If it appears uh, an hexagon and with your sample inside, everything is fine, it's sharp, so you have proper cooler illumination. Many times, when you close down the field diaphragm, it looks dark and you can barely see the sample. So what would you do? You need first to center the field diaphragm with these screws here. So I'll center the field diaphragm and then using this focus knob of the condenser, you will go with the condenser up and down until you focus very sharply these edges. Once the, the edges are focused, you open slightly the condenser and the field diaphragm and everything should be fine. If you're using DIC, you also want to adjust the Wollaston prism on top of the objective to increase your contrast. So the contrast in a bright field image is determined by the differences in light in absorption, refractive index or color. And it's acquired as light passes through the sample, altering its direction. So in very thin samples, they will be very transparent. And one of the ways to increase the visibility of structures when imaging with bright field is use light absorbing dyes such as eosine and emetoxylene. And please be aware that you need to, to do proper bright field image. Besides doing a, a good color illumination, you need to match the numerical aperture of the condenser to the numerical aperture of your objective. Because if you put too much light from the condenser to the objective, the objective will not be able to capture everything. I envision it as it looking at the sun. We have a lot of light, but if we look directly, we have so much light that besides being blind, we cannot see any details. So you need to match the uh, numerical aperture of your condenser to the numerical aperture of your objective as it what the amount of light that your numerical aperture of your objective can capture as matching the numerical aperture of my eyes to the amount of light that the sun is sending to me, to all of us. <laughs> so uh, this is a 40x uh, objective with the numerical aperture of the condenser open to its maximum. And this was the image that I was able to acquire. But if I decrease the numerical aperture of the condenser, you can see this was exactly the same image taking one after the other. There's actually something there. Maybe here, if you look very strongly now that you have some structures, you can see that there are something here. Can I increase this? Yes, I can. If I put the numerical aperture of the condenser, to matching the numerical aperture of my 40x objective, I can see much better the same sample. So this is what I mean, that you need to match the numer when doing bright field image, you need to match the numerical aperture of your condenser to the numerical aperture of your objective. And when you change objective, you need to adjust that again in a way to have the best image possible. It will always be a very transparent sample under bright field. But in this case, I can see, whereas in this case, I couldn't. And this is the same image that you can see a wider field of view of a bright field image properly adjusted with the cooler illumination and the numerical aperture of the condenser matching the numerical aperture of the objective using 
to acquire the image. Advantages of bright filed microscopy renders in its simplicity and the easy adjustments uh, required to do a very nice bright field image. It's also a very cheap technique in terms of the optic required to do bright field. The disadvantage is that many samples are actually nearly transparent to bright field. We can avoid that by staining the samples with light absorbing dyes such as hematoxylin or eosine, or if we could not, we do not want to stain the samples, we might need to recur to other transmitted light techniques that I will further explain. And now talking about dark field image. So these are two images of the eye of a mouse in a dark field with color cameras and pollen in dark field. Dark field images, dark field techniques gives very beautiful uh, uh, colored images as what you're observing now. And with a black and white camera, you can see the same sample as before being acquired in bright field or in dark field. So actually the cells are the ones that shine, whereas the background is black. So the principle of dark field is similar to the principle of an eclipse. When you block the moonlight, the stars in the sky will appear visible. The dark background will enhance the visibility of fainter objects. So using dark field, transparent samples can be easily seen without any staining. And this is a graphic showing what happens to the light rays in bright field illumination. We have the background the, and diffractive light, the diffractive wave, and then the spasm wave. And this is why it's really hard to see in background, in, a, in bright field, in seen samples, because the spasm wave is quite close to the background wave. On the other hand, in order to generate contrast to see an object, on dark field illumination, the spasm wave and the diffractive wave are quite close one to the other. That's what's captured by the objective. Therefore, the background wave is selectively illuminated. That's why you see it on a black background. So, and how does it happen? What happens is that before uh, the condenser, there's a, a field stop that will make the light rays that enter the condenser to be in an angle. And when they go into the sample, here is the objective, here is the sample plane, only the light that is diffracted will be captured by the objective. And the other light, as it entered in an angle, it is excluded from the objective. Therefore, you see only what passes through the sample and diffracted some light, and all the rest will have will be shown in a black background. So when to use dark field illumination? Dark field illumination is very useful for low magnifications up to 40x objective because the numerical aperture of the condenser needs to be higher than the numerical aperture of the objective in order to have dark field illumination. And if you wish to see everything in a liquid sample, there is all dark field is the perfect solution for it for you. The disadvantage sometimes is that you see really everything, even tiny dust particles are highly obviously obvious. And therefore, if your sample, if you want to image a sample that is not that clean, it, the image might appear confusing because every little thing in your sample will be visible. They are easy to obtain images 
uh, in the correct focal plane at a very low magnification and it's good for very small or very low contrast specimens. So phase contrast microscopy as well as dark field and the DIC were novel prizes in microscopy and I must say microscopy is a fantastic area because it's constantly evolving and the, the way scientists uh, discover new ways to approach and to see the unseen is for me outstanding. Going back to phase contrast microscopy, phase contrast microscopy allows to visualize samples that would otherwise be invisible by using interference instead of absorption. And you can see much clearly uh, when compared to bright field, extremely transparent samples. And here, again, the same image that before it looked like you were seeing it very well in bright field and exactly the same. You can see it's the same cells. Here is this telophase here and that one over there. It's exactly the same picture taken, uh, not the same picture, the same sample taken with bright field or with phase contrast. And you can see that with phase contrast, you see it much clearly. The, the phase contrast will have a phase analysis underneath the diaphragm in order to create the required interference and then a phase plate on uh, uh, the top of the objective. So phase analysis, the condenser, sample objective and the phase plate. So this graph will now compare what happens to the specimen wave under phase contrast illumination. So this is the specimen wave in bright field illumination and as I mentioned before, is quite close to the background uh, wave and that's why it's hard to see structures uh, in bright field illumination. But when with phase contrast illumination, the interference cause, uh, uh, causes a further separation from the, the specimen wave from the background wave and this will allow the samples to be more visible. So advantages of phase contrast microscopy is that it's possible to visualize structures that would be otherwise invisible in bright field and this would include certain organelles that could not be previously seen and therefore the images will look better uh, due to the details that it, this technique is able to capture. Moving on to another transmitted light technique, I will now talk about DIC, differential interference contrast. In there, in DIC, invisible features of the sample are made visible. It has a very complex optics that allows to obtain inf uh, information on the optical density of the sample. The image will be similar to phase contrast microscopy, but it doesn't have the phase hollow that is characteristic of the phase contrast images. And this phase hollow, it's a bright hollow that appears uh, quite often around the sample and can be very destructive. destructive. And this is a technique was, uh, theory was published in 1955. And here you can compare a bright field image here in a DIC image. I, I truly love uh, DIC. If you can see quite clearly uh, and if you look with the details, you can see that these are the chromosomes. These are the centrosomes and here you could even see the spindle. Um, when I did this image, actually I co-stained it with the uh, uh, DNA DAPI and alpha tubulin and gamma tubulin and I could quite clearly confirm that what I'm saying is actually true. This is a mitotic cell, chromosomes, microtubules and centrosomes. So the DIC, how does it work? It works by separating the light in two orthogonally polarized rays and they go through the sample 
at the same plane and they are combined before uh, observation. And the interference of those two parts when they are combined will be sensitive to the optical path that the light had went through and will cause a kind of a 3D structure that allows you to visualize very well the details inside of a scene previously transparent sample and unstained. So in terms of optics, you have the light, there's a polarizing filter, and there's a Wollaston prism that separates the light rays. They go through the condenser and through the sample separated, will be captured by the objective separated, and then there's a Wollaston prism that joins them again and the polarizing filter, and then the image will be uh, uh, captured by our eyes or by a camera. And this is the difference on adjusting the Wollaston prism or not. I don't know if you still remember in the beginning of the talk when I was talking about aligning cooler illumination, then I mentioned that if after aligning cooler illumination in DIC, to get further contrast on the image, you might want to adjust the Wollaston prism that's uh, on the top of the objective. And here is exactly the same sample that I have acquired with the Wollaston prism non-adjusted and the Wollaston prism adjusted. So when you compare DIC with phase contrast, uh, it actually produces higher resolution images. It shows very good contrast. DIC can be used in thick samples and it does not have the distracting halo of phase contrast microscopy. So DIC is actually an extremely uh, good technique for transmitted light microscopy, but the optics is complex and it's uh, actually the most expensive of them all. So in summary, from our lesson today, I would like you to remember to use the equipment carefully and respectfully, to choose the correct objectives, oils and cover slips for your particular application, to choose the correct transmitted light contrast that you're going to use, dark field, bright field, phase contrast, DIC, if you're not seeing it well, check your cooler illumination and properly align your cooler illumination. And if your image is still not good, try to adjust the numerical aperture of the condenser, the light filters, clean the lens and clean your sample. And this is all for today from the transmitted light microscopy lessons. Thank you very much for joining our Andor Microscopy School. On the next uh, courses of our Andor Microscopy School, we will present cameras for life science in microscopy. Please follow up on these very interesting courses. Thank you very much for listening.